Um, so the pleasure to welcome the four of you here. Um, we'll be talking about uh, the, the new book, Beyond the Square, um, which is actually also on sale over there for $28 plus tax. And that came out to, I don't know what, but there's change, right? Um, the book is also published uh, by Urban Research, which I'll just sort of say a quick word about. Urban Research is an imprint of Terraform, which is itself a kind of nonprofit founded by uh, urban theorist, architect, writer, Michael Sorkin, he's somewhere in the room. I've lost him. Well, there he is. Okay. Um, and so Terraform itself is a kind of venue, or maybe a collective, if I can call it that, committed to progressive urban research design and critical advocacy. And the UR book series, of which this is one, publishes projects from the practical to the utopian about the condition and future of the city. So it's a pleasure to have the four of you here, and I'll turn it over to the two uh, poets. Thank you, Hogan. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. It's uh, you know, a special moment to obviously publish this finally, after all the work that went in, and to be able to share this with so many familiar faces, and equally so many new ones. Obviously, the, the importance of public space in the central metropolis of Cairo, with Tafari Square, or in Bahrain, with the Pearl Roundabout, or Gorgiba Avenue, is very familiar um, to probably most of you, and was a central theme in, in much of the literature by people that were interested in urban dynamics, but also to many others who don't concentrate on it. But the impetus for this book was really to shift the tension away from these public squares, and to consider the broader context in which the uprising unfolded, but also how urban space itself intersected with the events themselves. So this book was you know, very much born out of that energy, optimism, and ambition of the Arab uprisings. And so I think you know, very much the first thing that Claire and I would, would like to do is to recognize all of those protesters um, that have and continue to put their bodies on the line um, and protest and continue to go out there despite the dangers and oppressive structures that are literally uh, destroying them to, to stop. Um, you know, they have created one of the most significant political events of our time that continues to reverberate till today. And doing a book really, you know, accumulate numerous debts and acts of generosity from, from people that is really humbling in many ways. And again, Claire and I are deeply grateful to all the contributors in the book. And it's wonderful that some of them could be here today. Dugu, who did a piece on Fikrita in Istanbul. Helga, who did a piece on Kaparakab in Palestine. Um, and really, I'd also like to thank Claire, my co-editor. She can see this on the card and she's cringing. But really, her razor intelligence, assistance, uh, like, and I can't believe that we're, you know, after doing this book, I can prove that you can still talk to your co-editor after. <laughs> but it's been a really fruitful uh, and edifying experience for me. Um, and yeah, the aim of this book was always to be interdisciplinary. Claire is an anthropologist, I'm a geographer. We had historians, media studies um, professors, and thanks to Julie Mekretu, but also Tamam Azam, whose artwork you can see over there in the middle there, who generously also gave his artwork, but can't be with us tonight, um, in my chapter on herbicide meant that this was really interdisciplinary in its most expansive sense. But also, of course, I have to give special thanks to Helga and to Greta, where Greta is, but whose enormous generosity, you know, to not only host us for this launch, but to put together this photo um, exhibition and all the printing and to bring Ahmed from the West Coast to speak with us tonight is uh, a debt, again, that Karen will struggle with ever to repay. So I don't, hope we don't have good debt collectors. <laughs> but, um, and also, there are many other people whose labor goes in 
into an event like to, uh, this tonight that obviously we don't see. Um, and one person in particular is uh, Sarah Rents, also from uh, Judy's office, that has been wonderful with all the different requests and queries and so on that we've had. Um, and Ahmed for coming all the way from the West Coast. Okay, so I'm just going to talk um, very briefly about the background um, of the book, just maybe three minutes. Um, so the impetus for the book really came from Dean's early recognition, uh, which he tackled in two essays he wrote for Jedalea in 2012, um, that there were underlying urban and spatial dimensions of the Arab uprising. And more concretely, this idea that the political upheaval was both impacting and impacted by space, and particularly urban space, in ways that extended <coughs> beyond what protesters were doing in squares and metropolitan centers across the region. So when Michael Sorkin uh, started the Urban Research Series, which Helga mentioned, um, it was really an opportunity to explore this topic in greater detail, and really a chance to look closely at the Arab uprising using a spatial lens. And additionally, it was a chance to move beyond what had been, at least until that time, this is 2012, um, and all of my optics, scholastic, and media focus on Tahrir Square in Cairo. Um, and from the outset, Dean and I wanted to take a broad view of the topic, both temporally and geographically, but thematically as well. Um, and the agenda here was to really take seriously this idea that the uprisings had and continue to have far-reaching spatial implications. That is to say that the political turmoil has changed and is changing how people use space, how they relate to and conceive of space, and how they connect with each other in specific spaces in diverse locations and contexts. <coughs> but we also wanted to explore this idea retrospectively to think about whether or not questions or concerns about urbanism and space had informed or underpinned the political turmoil in any way. So for example, we have Khaled Edham's essay um, a fascinating piece, actually, which looks at representations of space in pre-2011 dystopic Egyptian literature, and he explores what urban conditions were represented in the literature that foreshadowed the events of January 2011 in Egypt. Um, and from a geographical perspective, we wanted to look at what was happening in cities and spaces that had not been at the heart of the Arab uprisings, and we wanted to see if there were spatial repercussions or links um, to the political turmoil in places outside of, for example, Egypt and Cairo. Uh, so the volume includes essays on Jordan and Algeria, as well as Helga's piece on Palestine. Um, three contexts that I think have kind of not traditionally been associated with the up uprisings themselves. Um, and the same attitude applied to the thematic concerns of the book, where, again, we want to think expansively and creatively about the relationship between urbanism and space and the uprisings. So we have Dean's essay, which looks at Syria and the phenomenon of herbicide, which is the deliberate destruction of the urban fabric. And we have Jubu's essay on opposition to the Turkish government's urban redevelopment plans in Istanbul. And we have um, an essay by Asil Sawala on art and gentrification in uh, Amman. And again, the idea here was to think about different aspects of urban life and urban landscapes in the region and see where and how they intersected with the political transformations underway. Um, and I think Dean will agree with me that we were just very lucky to get to work with a number of uh, contributors who were already engaged with this idea, but we were also lucky to work with scholars who were working in context or on topics where the linkages weren't always uh, immediately apparent, but who were kind of nevertheless willing to, you know, quote unquote, go there with us um, and explore potential linkages. Um, and I think that the result is the book has a kind of um, exploratory character, particularly, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the connections between the essays, because, um, as we said in a piece we wrote for Gedalea, they don't always sit very easily side by side. Um, there's not a kind of neat thematic or temporal or geographical progression to the pieces. But this is also something that Dean and I really wanted for the project. Um, we didn't want to present a kind of neat package in which we claim to provide a total assessment of the spatial dynamics of the political upheaval. Um, instead, we wanted to propose linkages and raise questions and, and start a conversation. Um, and Dean is going to talk a little bit more specifically about tonight's event, but I would just say very quickly that Julia McCready's involvement in the project, which um, Dean and I were absolutely over the moon about, um, was exactly part of this agenda. To put different pieces of work and different kinds of work uh, in dialogue with one another.
there's a way of looking at the world and thinking and talking with each other in the, house, in the household. Um, but I was really attracted to maps. But they came later into my, into my work. Um, they came through a, way, through a different interest, which was how to try to deal with all these various uh, ideas that I was interested in or trying to ask questions about it in the world. And so um, this, this Cartesian way of trying to make sense of something you can't make sense of um, was a really attractive and a really kind of interesting, um, conceptually really interesting um, way of trying to process space and information. So that's really where I became attracted to with maps and, 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 and photography. And then from that, I think later, um, because of my uh, fascination with cities, um, the built environment and natural boundaries became an important metaphor for me. Ms. Mason, I can follow up. Um, and can, can we hear you? Okay. Okay. So maybe you can follow up um, to that um, to that uh, summary of when you came to maps. Um, so uh, as someone who teaches um, human geography at my university, and uh, I teach critical cartographies so looking at maps, and in some of the ways that you're articulating, sort of not seeing them simply reflections of the world, but as as artifacts that do other kinds of things and simply sort of hold a mirror up to the world, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So can you say more about um, how you see maps, can, how they can be a tool for doing things other than reflecting sort of objective reality? Do they do other things for you, critically, you know, analytically? Well, sure. And I think, like, I mean, I think we've seen that the playfulness with that in Borges and in that in the there's been this, you know, we can really understand the mapping and the history of that. The project is having a very political agenda. And I think it's something that we all don't really kind of hit, we don't grapple with regularly. And I think, like, um, I think for me, there's a therapy, there was a lot that I could play with in terms of that, that, that the effort to try to make sense of of the unsensical, or to try to play with the absurdity of the effort of photography, you know, as, as well as it's a very useful tool, and, and, and not to say that it's not really beautiful objects, and has it all the time, but this way of trying to tell a story, or this way of trying to make um, be create a narrative for the way we envision, the way we envision space, and um, and fantasy is 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 has been you know mythic space and, and also our book space. So, so to me it, it's it's really fascinating complex um, language which we we use in the language. I mean I don't I to me that is not true. Lies in that. A phrase I sometimes use a variation of my own process. Um, so if I can sort of be more specific now in, in relation to the subject matter of the text, and I'd ask you if you can talk about uh, the Mugama series, um, which, as mentioned, was created in response to the Arab Spring, if I remember correctly. How did the series develop, and why did you focus on this story, which is the nexus of Egyptian government gloves and the So, <coughs> I'll start with the second question first, because that's easy to answer. Um, I was at the end, usually titled the work and the make have I'm done with it, and some very rarely before. And these paintings, I was looking for a title, a, a, a title and I that building had been it, it stood out for me on the school. Um, and for many reasons, but the, 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 what it was called, I was also interested in its historic meaning, the meaning that it was, I think. If I understand the word correctly, it's been two years. It meant it, it, it was a place of, of it was a it was a structure that was actually three forms of worship in one space, in my understanding. So that it was a mosque, a church, and a synagogue could be accessed in the same place. Historically, this was the idea of that. I forgot what the word was. What was the name exactly? Um, Collective. Right. So there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. To me, that was this interesting, like when I was researching some of the names of these buildings, I was interested in that. It, it, you're looking skeptical, is that incorrect? Well, I think the name is, I mean, it's a Stalinist name of architecture, but I think that is, it's, it's a, uh, 
But the historic a complex of historic of, of government services, right? But that's what that building is, but the historic well, domain. It stood there before. Or the Terminal Gamba itself? The Terminal Gamba itself. Who gave to that? Yes. Not necessarily. Mugama at the end is the, 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 the collective of the digital. There you go. That, that's Mugama at the end, which is located somewhere else in, in Cairo. But I was interested in that name. But Mugama is collective, only collective, not necessarily okay, collective. related to religion. But I like the double meaning yeah, of that yeah. that came, Mugama even the way that it was considered collective, the source of that, from my understanding, the, the, the origin of that, in the, in the, not necessarily the meaning or translation, but that. What's it called? Mugama at the end. No, the, what is it called in the history of the word? The etymology. The etymology of the word, is, from my understanding, comes from its history. So maybe I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a historian, I'm an artist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we play with language like that. And so I was interested in that aspect of, the, of that, that building, but also because of this the bureaucracy, the, the kind of the structure of this building and what it ha what it symbolizes and what it ha what what it represents in terms of its history from this totalitarian kind of context in, in the Cairo. That's where the title came from. Um, the paintings I was interested in because I had been working on a painting in my studio in New York when the uprising in, 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 it took place in Tahrir Square and during those 18 days. I had the TV on in the studio, the computer on, and I was watching the lot while I was working on another painting. That painting um, was a painting where the architecture was really um, was back in New York and was looking at the buildings in New York, and this kind of the, the, the rupture of that somehow took place in the market in the painting. And then after that, I was invited to participate in the Documenta in Castle. Um, and that's an exhibition that happens every five years, it tends to be something that somehow um, gives, it gives each artist a good amount of space to really investigate something on a large scale if you want, but to investigate a thought in a deeper, kind of bigger way, and, and in, in an exhibition format. And, and this was, th I had just recently read um, a text by Nasser Halat, an art form called Circling the Square. And this, that was really, I was interested in what came up in that as this, as a, as a way of looking, because I was really paying attention to what had been going on. And I was really interested in following or questioning the excitement and the kind of, um, the contagious uh, kind of um, fervor that was taking place, not just there, but a lot across the globe, from to, to, we came into this country, into uh, this happening in Brazil, and all over. And I was interested in the, in, in, in the excitement there, but also with this intense caution, because my reality came from when my family left Ethiopia in 19, after, in 1977, after the revolution in 1975. So there's a certain amount of skepticism or, cons or kind of worry at the same time as this um, event is taking place. And for me, I mean, you know, I'm a child of, uh, of the early 70s. Um, uh, Mubarak had been the dic one of the longest serving dictators on the continent for my entire life mostly. And so to see someone like that be removed from this collective action, which in many ways is an action that was very, uh, kind of um, an action of like what we heard our parents' generation doing in a way, like especially in this country. And so it didn't feel, it felt like this very kind of an, almost an impossible situation. Because was, it, 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 how, how is this happening again? It was, kind of, it, was a, it was a surprise to that. And so I was really wanting to investigate that. And, and for me, one of the ways that I approach my, my painting and making is that I take uh, look, I, I, I research the architectural kind of history in terms of images of a place, and then usually those I project into the paintings, and then we draw those in. And so, of all the cities globally that we could find that had this type of event in it, in, in a public square in a major city, we or or had this type of event historically, we used those squares and those those the buildings that surrounded those places as a point of context for these four paintings. And then structurally, they you, you move from the interior of the square to the exterior of the square. And the, the, the paintings are vertical paintings that there are four parts to them. They, they can be seen in a line, they can be seen around you in, 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 a, in a diamond formation. But you can 
that you always, they're, they're, they're portraits of scale, so you always are looking up into the painting. And the build, even though many buildings are drawn upside down coming from above, it always feels like you can barely see over the, the building. You be, this, these buildings are in, in, in swallowing you, and you're immersed inside this history of all of these squares. And it somehow feels that feeling of when you're in, in, involved in the, like, in, um, immersed in the paintings, you really feel like, this, the, these sweat, the paintings somehow can circle you or move around you. And then the marks really are battling or participating with this and mer meshing with the architecture to become something else, to shift that, to shift the story, to shift what possibly could happen in the paintings. So I was just interested in, in questioning what the history was of those places, um, what were common um, types of architecture from these various cities, what were also differences. Um, it was interesting that a lot of European monuments existed inside of the squares that were of colonial history, but how Egyptian monuments exist in the squares in Paris and <laughs> elsewhere. So it's like um, you know, small little like notations like that. But really, they're like they they're about they're not. I mean, they're paintings, and they're meant to be engaged with these paintings, but they use this information to 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 um, to have a different type of physical kind of time based experience. So, uh, you continued your engagement with the Arab world uh, in your new piece, uh, Epigraph Damascus. Uh, is this work connected to your previous work? Um, if so, how? And has your work on the Arab world been impacted by the way in which the Arab uprisings have unfolded? I guess you can respond to every one of those. So, um, can you speak about your uh, Epigraph Damascus? Work and what's connected to your earlier work, and also um, have, has the way in which the Arab uprising unfolded affected your work. So, you know, so I don't know. think, for me, I feel like I'm, I'm an uh, artist who's engaged in the world around me as a citizen of the United States who's participating in global geopolitical events that are really, in many ways, taking place in that region in some in some in some way, and. For me, like the, a lot of the questioning of my work comes from that place, work from that region, um, or from like collective understandings of our history in terms of cities. I think that uh, so Damascus that 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 etching comes from a painting that I was that I started that I didn't finish that had that I was working on um, close to after soon after I finished this and I continued to be working. Um, but I think that um, it, it, there are certain cities that I've done portrait type of paintings about. But more, more than anything, I think that we, as, a, as an artist, it's an investigation and questions and, try, and trying to make sense of, of current reality through, through images, making abstract images, and really dealing with being able to talk or, or deal with images that are move into a realm of, that, that you can't really discuss or, or, or have, you know, Put into language, and um, so that's the, the interest. My interest with this, these uprisings, was really it was an African city that called me to, and so um, and and then the, and the history of its relationship to the African you know, diaspora. So um, I don't know. Just to answer the question. Thanks so much, and I really appreciate how you both uh, brought out the. Uh, in, in these representations, it's sort of um, transnational, if I can use that term, um, the genealogy of, of, of this conversation about uprisings and urban uprisings, but it's not just uh, you know, an Arab phenomenon. And how you are sort of, in contrast to the way in which this text um, has constructed the poem as an Arab urban poem, you're talking about African. Um, the African context, which I think is also a, a different way of thinking about it in important uh, geographic context. And so I, I just, just want to also just add, I think like um, the the my interest too is also about these aren't. I don't think of these at all as trying to represent that action, trying to represent that that um, 
necessarily even that time. They were made at a specific time that they represent. They're they really an investigation to um, offer a type of um, image of that type of infrastructure and then and a certain kind of nostalgic idea of that type of urban space, especially. And then how these act. So using that moment to kind of think, figure out. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Julia. Yeah, no okay. Uh, all right. So I prepared uh, a few comments um, and questions, uh, general questions for the um, the volume uh, editors and contributors to ponder, and perhaps Julie, if you want to come in as well. And uh, then, subsequently, more specific questions to each of the contributors, the authors, of the chapters that are present here. Um, so, um, and I'll try to situate these questions in uh, the broader discourse, if you want, of, um, of urban studies of the Middle East North Africa. So Beyond the Square is a book that appears at an interesting time in the study of Amina, or Middle East North Africa, I'll refer to it as Amina uh, going forward. Uh, an interesting time in the, in the study of Amina urbanism represents, in my view, an important expansion of the horizons of this interdisciplinary field. As Claire Panetta and Dean Sharp write in the introduction, this study represents the second, or perhaps even the third wave of scholarship on urbanism in the region since the 2011 uprisings. First came the more immediate, on-the-ground work that understandably focused on politics, and the social histories uh, of political struggle, along with work that focused on um, that focused on the central spaces and built forms in which the uprisings took place. Next came work arguably more concerned with the why and the how of the uprisings, often attributing the deeper causes to of the of these uprisings to neoliberal and more personal, regional, and geopolitical factors. The con contributions to Beyond the Square, as Sharp and Panetta claim, successfully in my, in my view, um, the, the questions uh, and contributions um, seek to broaden the horizons of this scholarship. The central concepts that the editors deploy is that of the socio-spatial, and the questions animating the text are, what are, soci what are the socio-spatial and not just the political or political economic dynamics of the uprisings? What is the relationship of the uprisings to spaces and spatial dynamics beyond the central built context in which that were more, the most visible? And what spaces outside of metropolitan areas played a role in these uprisings? What was that role? Space was not a big concern of the earlier work, and what focus there was was on, as mentioned, space um, was paid to, to the spatial layout. For example, the, the squares, the architecture, uh, with Tahrir Square in Cairo, often taken to be metonymous for the uprisings more generally. The book also represents a move away from the immediacy around the ground perspective dominant in the earlier periods to, more widely, to a more widely spatial and even three-dimensional point of view. In this connection, I like very much the contributors citing the work of A.L. Weizmann, Weizmann, who in his important work has called the Israeli occupation project a, quote, vertical occupation, and in the process has highlighted for us the dynamic interplay and interconnections between the various layers of geographic verticality, land and sea, air, and the subterranean in, in, the, in, 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 pol in politics, and spatial politics more generally. On this critique, Weizmann hinges a larger critique, that of, maps, that of the maps of geopolitics, whose flatness and two-dimensionality Weizmann shows is not a mere technical feature of a certain kind of cartography, but is, is itself both the politics along with the discourse of power. Beyond the Square shows clearly an engagement with this salutary trend in human geography and urban studies. As myself, an anthropologist who has worked for the most part of my career in the Arab, Persian, South Asian, Gulf region, I, I, know, I just call it the Gulf um, because I get, I get hammered every time I put a term in front of it. So the Gulf. But the, that well, not the ones here. Um, as, as, as a scholar who's worked for the most part of my career on the Gulf, I should add that Beyond the Square echoes and has also helped me think through my own work on how class is spatialized in Gulf societies. 
For a number of decades, class struggle in the Gulf has broadly taken the form of protests by foreign workers over issues such as non-payment of wages, working conditions, uncertain contracts, and similar, similar such issues. The contrast with Gulf citizen protests in this case is interesting. In recent decades, and really throughout the 20th century, the citizens, or Gulf nationals, have tended to mobilize instead, uh, and often at great risk of imprisonment or worse, around discourses of rights and, of rights and representation. This contrast to the more quote-unquote class-based protests by migrant workers ostensibly reflects the supposedly simple fact seen by many to characterize the modern world of so-called globalized nation-states, in which it is accepted that citizens and migrants inhabit and operate under different labor and rights regimes. However, as scholars such as Adam Hania and others working on the Gulf and yet others working on migrant labor in the global north have shown the citizen and migrant binary in the Gulf is not that different from the current regime prevailing in countries uh, as different from this region as the United States, the United Kingdom, and even Finland in the recent literature review I did, I discovered that uh, quite interestingly. All, all, uh, all these uh, situations of migrant on the one side National citizen on the other are products of similar socio-spatial and, as Panetta and Sharp would put it, socio—sorry, uh, products of similar socio-political and, as Panetta and Sharp would put it, socio-spatial politics. Um, we're, we're getting tired, okay? So I'm gonna, uh, for those of you who are not interested in the Gulf, I really apologize for the tedious excursion here into a, a concrete example. Um, most people think, well, you know, these are societies where very few nationals can do the work, so we have to import all these you know, foreigners, and the discrimination happens because uh, Gulf citizens are, you know, xenophobic and they don't want to share anything with the foreign, you know, sub racialized South Asians. And in fact, actually, it's, it's more, the story is more interesting and less, um, less sort of, um, less, uh, it's, it's a different story. For example, in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, well before, many scholars think of you know, these things as happening with neoliberalism, but in the 50s and 60s, it was Kuwait and Saudi Arabia uh, began deploying a strict migrant-citizen binary in a highly politicized time uh, of, of increased worker militancy uh, in terms of nationalism and um, uh, socialist claims and so on. Uh, the Gulf states at this time began spatializing citizenship in much narrower terms and mapping it onto what might, we might call a hierarchy of labor desirability, in which more and more of what was considered undesirable work would be seen as the natural, quote unquote, capacity of migrant workers, especially from South Asia. So infrastructural and structural work of economic and social reproduction became discursively constructed as migrant work. As scholars like Hania, the geographer Michelle Buckley, historian John Chalcraft, and political scientists, I don't know if Set the straight, the political scientist Robert Vitalis have shown, this process was not a simple reflection, as almost everyone, both within the Gulf and without today, believe. It was not a simple reflection of the supposedly obvious facts of there being too few Gulf people to do the work, of social reproduction, or the Gulf's inherent xenophobia, as mentioned before. Um, and I talk in this longer version, I can send it out, of the fact that when the migrant citizen binary was happening, generally speaking, in the Gulf, uh, this, another socio-spatial phenomenon, you could say, was taking place, which is workers struggling to universalize things like, um, like the rights that royal families were arrogating to themselves, and uh, critiquing the U.S. and British imperial presence, and uh, Saudi Arabian workers fighting against apartheid uh, uh, work spaces in which whites, European Americans, were, were paid more, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it was at this time, in this in this moment of threat, that suddenly. Uh, citizens were constructed uh, these are the migrants as uh, along this hierarchy of, uh, of this binary hierarchy. Um, and I will cut to, to um, I will move on to discussing more um, specifically um, these hopefully insights in relation to, to, to the book. But before I do that, a um, few people realize that the majority of people who did the work of that migrant workers do today in the Gulf, the majority of those in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in the 50s and 60s were national citizens. So uh, they, they, they were available and they were doing work in apartheid-like conditions, actually, or Jim Crow-like conditions. Uh, um, 
so what I'm going to do now is, um, basically what I'm saying uh, here, I hope that's clear, is that I'm, I'm giving you guys a, a big sort of, like, uh, thank you for helping me think of this process of migrant citizen as a spatial process, as well as a social political and economic process. And from that, proliferate all kinds of spaces, you know, where these sort of secondary compounds of the world. Your, your intervention actually really helps me think through that. So now on to my questions, and, and I have two questions. The first question is related to the question of materiality and related issues of infrastructures and technology. And the second question related to oil urbanism. Um, the first is related to materiality. In a seminal article in the Social Scientific Study of Infrastructures, uh, scholars Derich and Bell wrote, um, we look at on space as infrastructure, not as just a technological infrastructure, but an infrastructure through which we experience the world, end quote. The region Bell's uh, invitation to humanists and social sciences to study the quote-unquote infrastructure of experience and the experience of infrastructure has been one of the most promising recent developments in MENA urban scholarship, and there's a number of studies that have taken out this call. Um, with recent interest in the sociopolitics of materiality, both in Middle East and North African studies, and more widely in the social sciences, uh, coming also on the heels of Asif Bayat's book, Street Politics, James Holston with The Modernist City, and the work of geographers like Stephen Graham, as Dean has mentioned in his, in his chapter. Um, while this, this move is recent um, in, in the social sciences, it's also at the same time not so recent. This debate on so the sociopolitics of materiality and technology goes back at least to Marx, whose analysis of machinery and the factory space in volume one of Capital is worth mentioning. For Marx, machinery and automation are techniques of the appropriation of what we call surplus, uh, relative surplus value. The surplus value related, uh, resulting from the, quote, curtailment of necessary labor time, as opposed to what we call um, absolute surplus value, which was something that lengthened in the working day. More generally, Marx conceived of what he called a critical tech history of technology. Uh, many people are surprised to find this, actually, because they think of the same as technology is very new. What he called a critical history of technology is integral to his larger project of capital in revealing the, what he called the active relation of humans to nature, technology lays bare the process of the production of the social relations of human life and of the mental conceptions that flow from those relations. More recently, the work of Timothy Mitchell has also been important in this turn toward materiality. Uh, and I won't go too much in depth uh, in relation to carbon democracy, his recent, or not so recent, I guess, book on so-called technopolitics and his earlier works on what he calls technopolitics. So we see an, a, an updating of the project of Marx, but in a way an expansion of it beyond the initial concerns with the political economy as Marx understood it. Um, so for Mitchell, obviously, forms of political life like democracy, or what we understand to be democracy, um, are crucially flowing from specific forms of, as he called, effective intransigence, basically material material infrastructures, right, mines and shipping and lines and uh, uh, transport lines and so on. Um, so, so my first question is related to these issues. And this is to all contributors and editors. I agree that the concept of the socio-spatial highlights important aspects of the urbanism of the uprisings and the uprisings as urban phenomena. Um, however, I'm struck by the muted attention to, or maybe it's more accurate, say, a highly implicit engagement with materiality, infrastructures, and technopolitics. Realizing that this is an edited volume with specific constraints on space, this is not a major gap in the book. But I do wonder, do the editors and contributors envision future iterations of the project, of the project in which the technopolitical and in which materiality, as I've been discussing here, become a more central part of that project? Yes, I've got a couple and then the next question is related to oil urbanism and how oil might be not just, of course, carbon, but as a socio-spatial complex formation. Um, so, so, so we can think of oil also, uh, actually, we can think in terms of logistics and the logistics of oil extraction and transport. And here I'm thinking of 
works such as Deborah Cowan's The Deadly Life of Logistics, recently published, and Nale Khalidi, political theorist, anthropologist, uh, Jeff of all trades, brilliant Jeff of all trades, most recent work on global shipping, which I, to my knowledge is yet to be published. All this is very new work, and again, this is not a, a huge critique of the text because this is such a new field related to oil and logistics as sociopolitical. Um, um, so, what I wonder here is, uh, I'll come, I have a, a long here section on oil as an imaginary and work with Fernanda Cornel and others, but uh, I'll come to the actual question. And so, if we can think of oil uh, in relation to logistics and oil in relation to infrastructures, but oil as an imaginary, as Nadia Ficaro or Fernanda Cornel have written, that it, you know, the ideas of oil as a good life and oil as a form of sociality. Um, uh, um, so, you know, I guess gleaning from the literature of oil and logistics is um, that one comes away with an impression that the politics in it is in a deep sense technical and material. Right? Not in the sense of technocratic or reductive in a sort of very simplistic Marxist sense, but in the sense that material, um, uh, in, in the sense of a material built and engineered environment, um, and, and you know, on the one side, um, materiality, and on the other side, ideology and, and politics, in an imaginative sense, are co-constitutive to each other. Right? And you get that sense from you know, people like Cowan, uh, and then people who write on oil, oil urbanism as a you know, magical, magical, uh, this magical state of California. Um, so we might extend this kind of uh, thread by saying that first, the urban is both a material and a technical environment, and a social, cultural, and political one. And further, insofar as this is the case, the urban and uh, it is, along with politics, they are co-constitutive of each other. In what ways then does the Young Square speak to the more recent trends that you just mentioned in, in the scholarship? In what ways can we bring the city into conversation with uh, the work on logistics and oil urbanism? Is the concept of, the, quote, the city, let alone the urban, too diffuse or too complex to be captured by concepts such as logistics, infrastructure, or even materiality? Uh, I'll end there. That's great. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, just to give you a quick idea of what my uh, chapter is about, because I think it speaks to a lot of these issues uh, very well, which was on herbicide and the arrangement of violence in Syria. And herbicide is a, what is a political geography concept that has a, um, a very complex history that I won't go into, but to put the main point was that it's been the main concept through which we've understood urban destruction um, within geography. So with the vast destruction of the environment in Syria, I really wanted to know what this concept could tell us uh, about what was going on. I used to find out that this concept had been used in various uh, conflict scenarios and so on and so forth, and it had become rather dispersed. Um, but people like Stephen Graham and Al Wiseman had pointed towards how construction can be equally destructive, if you like, or violent, more accurately, um, and uh, should also be considered in uh, considerations of urban violence and conflict. And that whole chapter was trying to really break out of this binary of destruction and construction, which is where I think the literature has left us. So I was really thinking about these urban arrangements of violence in which less visible forms of uh, violence and conflict can manifest itself. So in the turning off of water and electricity supplies that we've seen in certain neighbourhoods in the context of Syria, and when a group acquiesces, then the turning back on of those basic urban services. Uh, also, of course, the restriction of mobility. I mean, Wiseman also highlights this in the case of uh, the Israeli occupation in Hollow Land. And how, of course, uh, the flow and circulation of basic goods can, of course, debilitate, debilitate whole communities and, of course, uh, people as well. 
Um, so, yeah, it's very much focused on these uh, entanglements of human and non-human elements, which draws, of course, uh, deeply from, from Mitchell's work, who is highly influenced by um, the Torian thinking and, and also this new trend in geography, uh, human geography, that I wanted to also contribute to this, uh, of this more, than, more than human geography. Now, to think of how these uh, infrastructural uh, entanglements impact our, our daily lives and, and how violence uh, and conflict can manifest themselves in our contemporary urban societies and specifically in the context of, of the Middle East. Um, and so I, I hope all of those issues you know, resonate deeply with the technical and material literature that people uh, like Graham and Mitchell um, uh, are gesturing towards. And also, of course, Lale and, and Deborah Cohen with the, the logistics work, I think I, it's all very new. So I think the, the, the results are, are still to be seen, but I hope as well that this, this work is definitely um, intertwined with, with what they're doing and trying to push that further. Thank you. But I don't think the city and the urban are, are too complex. I just think that we need to work at developing the languages to deal with these new um, urban landscapes, basically. And to be cautious to not fall into environmental determinism which is so easy to do, uh, and something that I really struggled with and hope I didn't uh, also reproduce. Um, I, could, I could say something kind of very generally about um, questions of infrastructure in Cairo and the January 25th revolution. And um, I mean, just to, a short answer to your question, is there more to say about materiality and infrastructure? Absolutely, that's like the hottest topic in anthropology right now, right? And so I definitely think that there's more work to be done on this. Um, but vis-a-vis uh, -vis the what happened in Cairo, I think two things. Um, I think looking at what happened with urban infrastructures during the actual political upheaval um, is kind of a relevant domain of inquiry. First, you have the kind of actual control of the streets and mobility and access to space. And you have kind of um, popular control of access to Tafriya, which seems kind of politically significant, right? Um, who was getting in, people, it was very organized. Who was getting in, people showing IDs, setting up barricades. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And then you also have very famously the Egyptian government um, shutting down of internet access. Um, another kind of uh, non-material infrastructure and the impact of that on, on what happened and on kind of uh, mobilizing people to go down into the streets. But. Um, what I actually think is, in some ways, maybe more interesting is what happened in Cairo after 2011, and specifically 2013, when uh, the military <coughs> regime came warring back. And the government's efforts to reclaim that space and the streets, uh, which I would consider you know, a, a kind of vital urban infrastructure, seems very significant. They uh, banned parking in downtown Cairo, which is this neighborhood immediately adjacent to Top Rear. They built a massive underground parking lot uh, under Top Rear itself. And really, it was you know these very kind of material concrete. And it was all under this rubric of like you know regulating congestion and alleviating you know, Cairo's some, of, some small fraction of Cairo's massive traffic problems. But really, this was about a kind of symbolic return to power. So I think the kind of struggle to control infrastructure, as you know, deemed as they chose uh, so well, is, uh, you know, I think all caught up in, in the political people, and I definitely think that there's kind of more, more work to be done on that. You know, I like, I like that you hinted that the symbolic aspect as well, and, and the way you're talking about not falling into technological determinism, or technological determinism, both forms of determinism are talking about, but obviously, so I like that, that you spoke to that a bit in your comment because I do get the sense in some literature, and my sense from Mitchell is that it can easily lend itself to a kind of a, a determinism of a sort, even though I, I, I hesitate to say this because I know his work is not deterministic in general, but um, the passage about how, you know, that, um, um, to sort of, the passage about how ideology is so secondary in a way to, um, 
this affected in terms of some of the control of the pipelines, controlling um, the railways, which helps them with the more in the earlier chapters of the months. Striking is quite going into that direction. And so I think um, what I would like to see as an archaeologist is, you know, like, okay, we, we get the point about our infrastructure is materiality. It's a very important fundamental point. But, um, you know, we need to sort of balance it a bit more, I think, with the symbolic, you know, agency um, that people, you know, think. And it have, you know, it, the emotional cognitive side. Or, and I can't believe I, I'm saying this. I can't believe I, I'm hearing myself say this. But I do need to have this almost nostalgic feeling for, like, you know, mental structures type stuff. Uh, which is a bit weird to admit. But, um, <laughs> Very sanitary and 
it's very effective. Um, and, and, but there seems to be like this implicit critique um, that um, what the, that the contribution of the chapter on herbicide and of the volume in general speaks to a kind of three dimensionality that is that is new that hasn't been done much before, right? Really like to know and really um, And I'm wondering whether that impression of yours isn't because you dealt only with maps uh, and uh, let's say the discourse of politics is largely inclusive as the, the sort of critical and atomistic sort of elements, let's say, and having to consider other kinds of media, like the media that, 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 that you're looking at here, uh, for example, film. You know, um, several films have been, that have been um, used on Syrian one that I didn't think of was called Returning to Us. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, I think that, that really speaks to your idea of herbicide as a vertical um, geography. Um, really well. It shows, uh, Returning to Us is basically about young, um, uh, young anti asset fighters, like young men, like normal guys, right, who became uh, enrolled in the resistance movement and um, in, in the city of Homs in, in North Syria, Central Syria, I suppose. And um, the, the, the camera follows them through the, the destroyed buildings and, and in a very Weizmann esque kind of gesture, they're moving through walls, right? And they're, they're avoiding the, the Syrian <coughs> artillery by hiding behind walls and moving through subterranean. Um, you know, sellers and, and you know, sniping from roofs and so on. And, and that representation really gives you a sense of the the complex and multi-layered geography. I mean, they're not just dealing with flat space at all. It adds their incredible, um, incredible dynamism, I guess, uh, for lack of a term, to, to the to the ur the urban setting. And I don't know if this is a question or more about observation, but um, have you considered the way that your critique plays out in these other sort of design to film the sort of medium of design? Definitely, and there's no. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ask uh, do you think I've got a Soft form of resistance and 
Uh, so when I read, you know, Istanbul City of Resistance, I'm thinking of, you know, maybe I'm very sort of simple-minded here, but I'm thinking of, you know, the police fighting against the protesters and, 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 and taxing them, and, and so I'm thinking of more sort of conflictual kind of, you know, so can you say a little bit more about why you call this resistance? <laughs>
protesting, filing lawsuits, protesting, doing stuff constantly. I mean, yes, most of the time these protests like didn't really work because you know we have the third bridge, we have the third airport right now. But at least I think it's just starting this public debate about what these projects are actually doing and uh, what it is doing to the living space, living environment. And so there's this constant resistance going on. It's very much muted here because I, you know, um, I didn't want to make the chapter about the uprisings per se, but you know how it's like relating to my fieldwork side, which is Pikitepe, heavily. Um, Government, I mean, they vote mostly for the occupy government, like 70%, and uh, they were very much uh, against the protests and very suspicious uh, of the protesters and stuff. But during my field work, it was very challenging for me, too, because, you know, I was part of the protest. I, I was um, a spokesperson for Istanbul Women's Platform, Istanbul City Defense, and um, it made my job like really hard because, you know, my presence in Ikitiba was like kind of uh, approached with suspicion. Um, you know, I'm trying to make it sound polite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very challenging field work, but the interesting thing was that having that kind of like dialogue, you know, talking about your concerns and um, trying to, you know, show a different type of perspective, a different kind of about the city and the space and like what it does to all of us, not just them. And um, that kind of uh, created these, you know, um, dynamics, which these like two very polar opposite groups that were uh, coming together. And um, it was actually like me who kind of created this bridge uh, between the Gates of Park protesters and and the residents in Tikis have been like offering them like a new perspective as well to understand these projects and what those projects are doing. Yeah. Has anyone got any questions? We've got time for a minute or three before we wrap up and run off to watch uh, Trump Clinton's <laughs> Well, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. It was a real pleasure. And